So I'm sure some of you are wondering why it's even important to talk about the best and worst strategy guides ever written. Uh, pretty simple, lessons for the latter, inspiration from the former. Even before I had the idea to do this channel and stuff, I've gone out and deliberately bought the worst one because I wanted to have physical evidence that people were stupid enough to do that. And I've deliberately bought the best one because it was genius. It, typically these days we just want one answer real quick for the game we're playing, so we just grab our phone or whatever and head to Google or YouTube. But there was a time, and kind of still is, where having a physical book in your lap while you're doing things that you could flip through without having to worry about connections or loading times was just plain convenient. So let's return to the days of yore where if you ever wanted to learn something or get any information you had to join the Dead Tree Club. That's not to say they still don't make strategy guides, but I'm going back to a time where they were more ubiquitous and common. There'd be an entire shelf or wall of them at Walmart, Best Buy, whatever gaming store you wanted to go to. And generally, they didn't have them shrink-wrapped or anything, so you could just pick them right up off the shelf and flip through them right there in the store. I mean, yeah, on the one hand, I get it. It's not a library. On the other hand, you're able to see how the game works, what to expect in it, the hidden cool stuff they didn't show you in the commercials, and just generally, it was almost like in one of those gaming magazines where... It could help influence whether or not you wanted to buy the game, even if you didn't get the guide with it as well. Of course, if it's a popular game, you find something like this at Walmart. Damn kids. Buying this felt like I was rescuing a puppy from a shelter. So like biographies, strategy guides come in two flavors. Unofficial and official. Unofficial, obviously, they had to write it themselves and figure it out themselves. Official guides are, again, obviously usually done in tandem with and with input from the developers and company of the game. Which, that input is going to be important in a second. And to show what I mean about developer input, here's the official guide for Metal Gear Solid V Phantom Pain. This is the special edition of it, comes with some neat artwork in it. Look, I'll admit real quick I'm weak for art and steelbook cases. Anyway, like I said, it's official and had developer help. Or should I say, intervention. Page 324, let's read along. Observant readers will have noticed the glaring absence of Mission 46 in the game's mission list. This does exist, but very specific conditions must be met before this secret episode is unlocked. At the express request of Konami, we cannot reveal details on how to unlock Mission 46, or discuss anything about its contents. If anyone recognizes what they're trying to hide, you'll remember that this is something that was very swiftly spoiled on the internet, either the day of or even a few days before the game even came out. Now I'm going to dig into my contract law education about this. I'm not a lawyer, but this is something that was taught to us in business and certification classes. Specifically, so we didn't attract lawyers. In short, if you read a strategy guide, you expect it to have all the information in it. That goes both ways, and back up the chain, Konami should have the reasonable expectation that if they are endorsing and giving input on a strategy guide, then since it's a strategy guide, whoever's going to read it will expect it to have all the information that's pertinent to them in it. So, as the writer of the strategy guide, you have a reasonable expectation that Konami is going to be forthcoming with all of that information so that it can be shared in full to the customer and the reader. Again, not a lawyer, but I expect that this is challenged in some way, then the words tortious interference would probably come up in some fashion, which is effectively a fancy way of saying Konami is trying to legally prevent us from doing our proper job for the customer. Don't get the idea to sue anyone, though, because the most likely result would be just a reprint of the book and a 
on an email or text document sent out to everybody who purchased it previously. A lot of business and civil uh, cases don't actually result in monetary payout. Well, that was really bad, so what's the good one? Oh, that was bad. But that was only one section, uh, one level, versus the rest of the book, which was still very detailed about the missions, the items, and things like that. Keep in mind everything I've explained to you before as I introduce you to... Final Fantasy IX. Yet another critically acclaimed game in the series. And if you're old enough, you probably just screamed, I knew it. This is the official guide for Final Fantasy IX. It advertises enhancement using Squaresoft's Play Online. So here's how that enhancement works. Read along if you can. Let's uh, pick a random page here. Uh, 62 looks like a good one. So those little blue boxes have codes for secret stuff. You take the keyword, you go to play online, you punch it all in. It tells you what is normally included in the strategy guide. This is every page. And it can get really stupid with it. Check page 192 in the section Side Quests, Mini Games, and Secrets. None of what this section calls itself is actually revealed to a legitimate extent. And it's not just hidden items or whatever that you're expecting to look for in a Final Fantasy game. Oh no. They do this crap with bosses and character skills as well. Page 196, the hidden super boss of the game. Only gives three lines of hints, then says the full details are on the website. Oh, but page 78 and 79 only have two boxes, so it's not always bad, is it? Well, let's quote those two boxes. You'll have a chance to upgrade your armor and weaponry here. Find out where and how at Play Online. They're literally not telling you where a store is in the city. Here's the other one. Notice anything out of the ordinary here? Find out what it is at Play Online. Useless, right? This was $13 when it came out, along with $50 for the actual game. And here's the two major issues this guide causes. In the US, this game came out in 2001. Back then, broadband was still not widely available. Most everybody was on 56k dial-up. So, you go to a website, especially a corporate website, and you would have issues with a lot of images, banner ads, things like that, bogging down processing speed, loading speed, and connection speed. Generally speaking, it took until 2007 for at least half of United States internet users to be on broadband. So, if you're seeing this game, and you see this on the shelf, and then you flip through it and see all this stuff about go online, log in, do this, search for that. You're probably thinking to yourself, my god, my internet sucks. This is useless to me. And when you think to yourself that it's useless, are you going to want to buy the game that, without this being useful, this becomes a pain in the ass to play. But here's the second thing. Game FAQs had existed for years by then. Even if you didn't know about game FAQs at the time, what would happen when you're trying to figure out this Play Online website? So you decide to search for Final Fantasy IX Walkthrough. Find out, hey, I don't see any results for Play Online, but what's this game FAQs thing I'm seeing? So this book got you to spend $13 on it, and then more or less told you to go online to find all the information for free that it should have told you by now. The more you read this book, the more it feels like it's actually actively insulting you. In 2003, this wound up on GameSpy's list of dumbest moments in gaming as a reader submission. 
And it's there that some interesting info comes up. And to be clear, I didn't discover this guide from the article I had personal experience with it in 2002. Anyway, apparently in Japan they didn't even release a guide and put it all on Play Online itself. They describe the low sales and reaction to the guides with the following lines. We believe this has produced definite results. We have also decided, however, to publish a strategy guide for Final Fantasy X. And remember, official guides send residuals back to the company that was supporting them. So in this case, by screwing up on the strategy guide, Squaresoft screwed themselves out of some extra money. Like the article says, it's hard to say if the guide itself directly caused a loss in sales of the game, but with what I described earlier, I can see it partly being involved. But remember, it also came after FF8, and that one, for various reasons, might have caused hesitation toward buying Final Fantasy IX. So in summary, you have a strategy guide so bad, it damages revenue to the company by not being appealing to buy, it may drive customers away from buying the game itself, and by luring people online, it led them to free access to information for video games as a whole, which also damages the strategy guide market itself as a whole. Impressive work, you guys. Really well done. Speaking of well done, let's talk about the best one. So since people over time gravitated toward the internet, the strategy guides needed another reason to still be useful. Although, to reiterate, sometimes you just can't beat having the stuff right there at your hand to flip through nice and quick. That said, as I mentioned, a lot of times they'll include artwork sections, big or small. A couple times I've gotten soundtrack CDs out of them. And the special edition guide for StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm actually came with paper models you could build. Now that's some impressive stuff, and I'm not knocking any of it. It's pretty awesome, especially for the soundtracks to be in there as a bonus gift. But let's focus on the books and what they do. Because, while a lot of you have probably heard of the Final Fantasy IX fiasco, some of you may not know about the strategy guide for Myst. When I first opened it, this is written in a way that I've never seen before or since for a strategy guide. Now, there is a section in here, the second part, that is the typical here's your checklist you go here you do that you know get through the game however part one is let's just say where the magic happens I suppose how appropriate that for a game where you travel to different worlds using books the walkthrough guide is written as if it's an actual explorer leaving a journal for the folks back home to read. Uh, let me read a segment to you to give you an idea. Page 74. I pulled out my journal, double checked. Yes, set at 135 degrees. I tried to click the corresponding compass button, but I hit the wrong one. Automatic power shutdown. Embarrassing. Had to fumble back upstairs again, crank up generator in the lighthouse again, then return. I finally set the compass correctly, pushing the 12th button clockwise from the north at the tip of the lower right red triangle. Suddenly the room was flooded with light. The source? A submersible lamp just beyond the window. The flashing light I saw on the telescope marks its position, no doubt. Then I remembered sketches of this lamp in the stone ship journal back in the mist library. Ingenious. I know I keep repeating that word, but really, what else can I say? The author of the book is Rick Barba, and in the revised editions forward, they mentioned they sold 300,000 copies of the first version of the book. And I honestly believe that their approach to writing it helped with that. Also, Russ... Russell 
De Maria, De, Mar De Maria is credited as an author, but I think their contribution is an interview with the creators of Mist in the back of the book, which still a cool thing to have as well. So if you bought this strategy guide and you didn't even have the game or play it, what are you left with? Well, an actual book. A short story or a novella, if you will. That's why I say that this strategy guide is the best. Because not for it having all the information you need in it or adding in an interview with the creators, but just because of the inspired way that it was actually written. This shows that when it comes to art and creativity, anything can be the inspiration or the canvas, so to speak. Here we have somebody that was able to novelize the game itself within the strategy guide when so many other people probably would have gone the easy route of go here, do this, wins launch. I have to wonder how many people actually bought this guide purely for the story written in it and not to beat the game. So there you have it. A bit of a trip down nostalgia lane for some of us, but hopefully you came out the other end with some interesting facts and ideas. Also, if you've noticed our new little friend here, they could use some more friends too. So if you want to draw, doodle, whatever, make some tadpoles to help them make some friends, Go on X Twitter and uh, share what you have with my Twitter account. Well, make sure to stick it in the videos and share it on community and Twitter and things like that to make sure that you're the one recognized and it's not just something that I use. Thanks again to Broken Mirror for the suggestion in the tadpole, which inspired me to ask not for a mascot of the channel, but for the community to express themselves. Help out the channel with subscriptions, likes, and shares, and uh, I could use the help because up next is a minefield of a topic for YouTube. Insane Clown Posse. Take care of yourselves, everybody. And as always, please support the official release, even if they suck.